cost of living. Housing prices in Canada are still through the roof, with record high interest rates driving up mortgage payments, low inventory, and stubborn rates of inflation. Canadians are feeling the pinch. And Liberals are feeling the pressure. Public opinion polls show Pierre Polyev's Conservatives are as much as 14 points ahead of the Liberals nationally. And this Nanos research survey, done exclusively for our program, shows on the specific issue of who Canadians trust to fix the housing crisis, the Liberals are being squeezed on either side. The numbers show the Tories and the NDP are far and away the most trusted federal parties when it comes to addressing skyrocketing housing costs. So how will the Liberals address the issue as Parliament resumes? Sean Fraser is the Minister of Housing. Hi, Minister. Good to see you. Thank you so much for making the time. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. Last week, Minister, during our interview, you told Canadians there would be new housing minister, m measures pardon me, on the table from your government on or before the fall economic statement. So I want to start there, kind of ask you some specifics about what people watching this morning uh, and today might anticipate or expect in that vein. First, about three weeks ago, at your government's cabinet retreat, you floated the idea of a cap on international student visas. Will your government proceed with that? Uh, right now, we're focused on partnering with institutions to identify the best path forward. My preference is to continue to welcome uh, significant numbers of international students because the program is good for Canada, both in the short term and the long term when you create a pipeline of, of potential new citizens. But we have to make sure that we're partnering with provincial governments and institutions to ensure that uh, students are supported when they're here and the communities have the housing capacity to absorb them. So first and foremost, our, our focus is gonna be on partnering with institutions to figure out the best path forward, but we don't wanna take any options off the table to solve some of the challenges around housing in communities that host uh, post-secondary education institutions. If you have all that consultation to embark on, why did you float the idea in the first place? Was it aimed at distracting Canadians from a lack of progress on the file? No, I sometimes have the bad habit of answering questions directly. Uh, when it was put to me whether we should consider a, a particular measure, I thought we should be considering uh, all measures because we do have to address these issues. I'm going to continue to try to answer questions directly where I can, uh, but realistically, uh, you know, if you go back and uh, uh, watch the tape of my original answer, you'll see that uh, I indicated that it may be premature to do something like that because we need to have conversations with our partners first. So, so just, just to be clear then for people watching, am I to interpret this as that you're nowhere close to proceeding on something like that? Uh, we're still in conversations that actually began while I was in my position as uh, the Minister of Immigration uh, to establish some kind of a trusted partner model with different institutions. And I think we have to uh, let that runway play out before we take a final decision on the path forward. I'm glad you brought up your time as immigration minister because I was thinking back to another time I asked you, I think following that cabinet retreat about the prospect of this happening. And you mentioned that the real sort of increase in numbers because we have seen a doubling over the last eight years happened just in the last two years. You occupied the portfolio over those last two years. Why did you not initiate these conversations any sooner given the housing crisis we are facing? Well, we actually did. Uh, we started the consultation uh, while I was in that position, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, but one of the other things that was uh, unique is if you look back to the student numbers during the COVID-19 pandemic, when obviously immigration was uh, extremely challenging with borders being closed, uh, there was a significant dip uh, for one of the years in the number of study permits that were issued, obviously, as people couldn't travel around the world. And since then, uh, it, it had exploded. And whenever you're dealing with a social Social phenomenon uh, as a government uh, that uh, came a, a, as a, 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 that you experience as a different degree than you may have expected, uh, then you have to respond after the social phenomenon happens. Uh, we were dealing with uncertain territory as uh, people sought to come to Canada because during the pandemic, Canada actually became the top destination in the world for people who were thinking of leaving their country of origin to pursue economic opportunity somewhere else. This is a good thing, but we do need to respond when you see a dramatic expansion in numbers so quickly. There's some other challenges as well, because the actual decision on which institutions get to welcome international students is within the purview of provincial governments. So we have to work across levels of government and with our partners in the post-secondary education sphere to make sure we land on the right policy. And that work has been going on for some time now. And I take your point that this isn't something, you know, you snap your fingers and you make a policy on. But, but with all due respect, you're describing something, a phenomenon that happened over the course of two years. You said consultations had begun. So are, are we, again, to interpret that from that, that you've been having these conversations for years and still have not arrived at a decision? And, and I'm asking against the backdrop of 800,000 people seeking homes and places to live, which is completely understandable because they're coming here to study, obviously. 
but you know, again, contrasted with all the other people who also have led to an increase in demand for a constricted supply. So it's absolutely something that I think uh, we need to address. But just to uh, underscore the nature of the challenge that we're dealing with, when we look at our temporary residency programs, the way that Canada's laws operate is that on permanent residency, we set a target each year. We table an immigration levels plan in the House of Commons, and we uh, seek to welcome as permanent residents a particular number of people. Historically, and, and still today, the uh, way that our immigration system works is our temporary programs, whether you're dealing with tourists, temporary workers, or international students, they're driven by demand. And if we were going to shift the way that we operate that to set a target or to align the numbers with the housing capacity, it's a monumental change in the way that Canada does immigration. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but it does mean if we're seeking to make a permanent change to the way that Canada's immigration laws operate, we have to do it right. And we have to do it in partnership with other levels of government who have jurisdiction over education and also with institutions who I think have a duty to uh, play part of a a role in housing the people who come here. So these are complex uh, uh, challenges to solve. We did start our consultation as part of the strategic immigration review that was ongoing and is nearly complete now. And I anticipate that in the months ahead, uh, you'll see uh, new opportunities for us to better partner with institutions and provincial governments to make sure that communities that welcome international students, which again is a good thing for Canada, have the capacity to successfully integrate them after they arrive. Yeah, and certainly, uh, Minister, I'm not trying to pretend that the situation isn't complex, but I think for Canadians who are concerned about their ability to put a roof over their head, complexity is often cited by your government as a reason for a lack of action. So that's why I pose the question I do. More largely, I wondered if I could ask you bluntly about immigration targets, because that factored into the conversation during the cabinet retreat as well. Uh, is your government considering changing the ambitious targets that you set out while you were Minister of Immigration at all? Will those targets change going forward at all? Uh, look, that's going to be a question for uh, Minister Miller, who's got a responsibility to table the immigration levels plan by November of this year. Uh, and one of the things before I address your, your, your question uh, more specifically, I think it's important that when we're looking at the answer to our housing challenges, we also focus on what we can do to increase the supply. I think it's essential that we remember that immigration remains one of Canada's uh, uh, strongest competitive advantages in the global economy. Having communities that welcome people, that welcome doctors, that welcome home builders, that welcome engineers, that welcome people who are going to be making a productive contribution to our economy is essential, and I don't want to lose that. So we can't just have our housing conversations be a conversation about immigration. But I do want to say that when we look to the uh, future of immigration levels planning, we want to maintain ambition in immigration, but we want to better align our immigration policies with the absorptive capacity of communities. That includes housing, that includes health care, that includes infrastructure and communities. I don't think we necessarily need to reduce the number of uh, newcomers who uh, come as permanent residents each year, particularly when you consider it's common for almost half of the permanent residents that we welcome uh, as, as being a permanent resident each year are already here as temporary residents. I think we have some work to do with the temporary programs which currently operate uh, on the basis of demand in an uncapped way. And if we can do some work to align our temporary programs with the number of spaces we make available available for permanent residents, I think we can successfully absorb uh, significant numbers of people and take the economic benefits and at the same time build our communities in a way that allows them to thrive once they arrive. Yeah, my motivation certainly isn't to um, insinuate to, to viewers that this is only a demand side uh, issue as well. I, I just listened very carefully to all the ministers who answered that question at the cabinet retreat and nobody would say unequivocally or not whether that uh, target, which was a big hallmark of your government's policy for a number of years, was going to change. Like, no one would be unequivocal about it. That's the genesis of, of why I was asking you. Uh, before I let you go, Minister, I do want to ask you about the supply side, and specifically about a policy that your government, your party rather, proposed in 2015 and then again in 2021, and that is removing the GST or supplying some sort of GST rebate for rental builds. Why has your government not proceeded yet with that? And if you had, would we perhaps have abated some of the situation we're in right now? 
One of the things that you got to be very careful about when you look at that specific policy proposal is that you don't do it in a way that simply subsidizes the construction of luxury apartments. If you have a, a blanket GST cut for rental construction right across Canada, uh, it's possible that that same uh, subsidy effectively will benefit the uh, wealthiest people in Canada who are going to build more homes. If we actually incentivize developers to build homes that uh, working class people, the middle class Canadians, the students, that seniors can afford in the communities where they live, then I think we have room to play. But I think there's a number of different policy options that we're looking at right now that would have the potential to change the equation and incentivize developers and nonprofits to build the kind of housing stock that regular people can afford. And we're trying to uh, analyze the different options right now to come up with a decision in the short term as to what will have the best impact to get more homes built at a price that ordinary Canadians can actually afford. With all due respect, Minister, why wasn't that analysis done back in 2015 or 2021 when you were making policy proposals like that? And doesn't that continue to imbue a sense on Canadians that your government has yet to take the housing crisis seriously? Uh, no, I would uh, disagree respectfully with uh, with uh, the way you've articulated that point. Uh, when we came into office in 2015, uh, we came to understand the scale of the housing crisis for low-income families was extraordinary. And we put most of our energy into programs that were designed to build more stock for low-income Canadians who needed uh, publicly subsidized social housing. But you proposed course, it in 2015. With respect, I pardon the interruption. You proposed that policy in 2015. Regardless of where I, you say your mind was, you still proposed that policy. I, I'm well aware, and I had the opportunity to discuss with my colleague, the former housing minister, Johnny Duclos, his analysis at the time was that we could get more bang for the buck and house more vulnerable people by putting our resources into the national housing strategy to build more affordable stock for low-income families. But the circumstances have changed. Over the course of the pandemic, when more people were buying up additional real estate, and since with the change in interest rates more recently, we are seeing more and more middle-class families feel a pinch in a way that they were not necessarily in 2015. This demands that we reassess the value proposition that different policies uh, are going to have if we're trying not only to build low-income housing for uh, the most vulnerable Canadians, but at the same time incentivize other levels of government and the private sector and the nonprofit sector to change the way they do things to build more housing at a price point that middle-class families can afford. So as the landscape changes, I believe our policy landscape needs to shift as well. And that's why you're seeing a renewed focus from me on the different opportunities we're going to have to build housing, not just for the lowest income families in Canada, but for middle class families, for seniors and students who are struggling in a way that they may not have been back in 2015. Okay, Minister, I am out of time. I appreciate your time as always. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Patchy.